Um, inshallah, I'd like to introduce Aisha Lima. She is the Director General of the Islamic Ni Education Trust in Nigeria. She accepted Islam in 1961, so I'm sure she's seen a lot of changes, mashallah. And um, she is the author of many books and literature and um, has, is the current chairperson of the Federation of Muslim Women's Association of Nigeria. I'm sure she can tell you a lot more, inshallah. Chairperson, brothers and sisters, salamu alaikum. Uh, as the chairman mentioned, my conversion to Islam goes back uh, 35 years. So it's not uh, like Yvonne's case, something that happened to her very recently. And going through a number of experiences in her uh, age of maturity, I would say. If I were to trace my own uh, journey to Islam, I would need to go back perhaps to uh, childhood and uh, take note of my own religious background and upbringing. Um, I was born in Dorset in the southwest of England and I could say my childhood was happy and very normal. Uh, my parents both uh, at least nominally subscribed to the Church of England and they made sure that uh, my sister and I went to Sunday school and that we uh, went to church on uh, some Sundays at least of the year. Uh, that we went to a Church of England secondary school. However, this is something that is difficult for a Muslim to believe that throughout my entire childhood and uh, teenage, I do not remember either of my parents mentioning the name of God or talking about religion at all. And I think this is one of the inhibitions that many English people have, they feel very shy talking about religion to the extent that they wouldn't talk about it even to their own children to discuss belief. So I think many English people, when they're asked what is your um, religious belief or what's your church, they sort of mutter C of E, Church of England, uh, but that it doesn't really mean much other than that, well, that's what people believe and so uh, that's what I am as well. Um, in my own case, however, I found that when I reached the, my teenage, I was more curious to know about where do we come from, where are we going, those questions that are normally addressed by religion, and I started asking them. And I was not finding the answers in the church that I was uh, attending. I was a very keen reader, and from the age of about 13, I was reading books that probably were a bit advanced for my age, and I came across one on Chinese thought and Chinese philosophy. Of course, we're talking about ancient Chinese thought and philosophy. And I found it extremely interesting, a perspective that I had never thought of before. And I began to read more on those lines. Um, that led, of course, into reading more about uh, Buddhism. So I'm talking now of reaching the age of about uh, 14, 15, and over the following years, I also began to read about uh, Hinduism, uh, not in its uh, popular form, but in the philosophy of Hinduism. And having heard from a number of other people, men and women, who converted to Islam uh, in, the last, uh, in the second half of the last century, I think it was a path that many of us followed, searching for truth, 
somewhere other than where we had been brought up. Some time I spent in that search. Several years I was in that search and I used to read a lot and I used to think a lot and I used to discuss with other people. And in all of these religions I would find elements of truth that yes, I could accept this, yes, I could accept that. But there would always be something there that I couldn't accept. And I think particularly in the Far Eastern religions, it was the aspect of um, denying this world, denial of this world, and regarding the, this world as a, a snare, a trap, something that you should try to get out of. You should free yourself from multiple rebirth. You should free yourself by detaching yourself completely. And I could never really see that the world was that bad that we would try to ex make ourselves extinct. So I could say that I had looked at what I thought then were the other options. You may ask, why didn't you start reading books on Islam? I think for the same reason that Yvonne mentioned, that subtly from early times, we are given some prejudices against Islam. And the belief that it's a religion of fanatics, it's a religion that makes no sense. Even back in the time I'm talking about, in the late 50s and early 60s, uh, that was quite a common belief. At that time, there were not all that many Muslims in England. And so there wasn't much, uh, you know, whereby you would actually be able to hear from a Muslim what they really believe in. Books that were around then were mostly by the Orientalists, and that would reinforce the idea that Islam is a, an odd kind of uh, religion and not something that would be of interest to a European. Now, I had still followed up my interest in Chinese philosophy and everything about China. I was very interested in China, its philosophy, its art, uh, its history. And so I applied to School of Oriental and African Studies in the University of London, and uh, I was given admission. That was in 1961. Now, by that stage, having been through what I thought were all the religions that were worth looking at, I found I can't believe any of these. And I entered for a short while a period of what one would call nihilism. That, look, I just do not know whether any of these things can be believed in. Or is it, as scientists say, that we just consist of uh, molecules whirring around atoms, and so we have a period that is called being alive, and then after that, you go into something that they say is being dead, and that's it. You live, and you die, and it has no meaning. And that is a very disturbing belief indeed, to feel that your life has no meaning, no significance whatsoever. And so, I think I turned at that stage just after I was admitted to University of London and said, look, God, if you're there, I need help. I don't know if you're there, but if you are there, please listen to me because I'm worried. I need help. Can I have your attention, please? Would Hamda from Brentford, that's Hamda from Brentford, please come to the organized office. Thank you. So that was my situation, October 1961. And I started my studies of Chinese uh, language and culture in the university. It was very strange that within that month of October, I began to meet Muslims. Now, that may not be surprising at the School of Oriental and African Studies, but the people I first met were not in that college, and it was what one would say accidental. 
but we don't believe that anything is really accidental. Muslims started speaking to me and in a very forthright manner, doing the dawah, telling me about Islam, giving me books, saying, read this and bring it back next week. I want to hear what you think of it. That was very clever because a lot of people dish out pamphlets and books and they never know what is the outcome. But when you're told, read this and I'll see you in a week's time, you tell me what you think of it, then you are bound <laughs> to read it. So I began to read these books with the feeling of, well, let me just satisfy this person that I've read it. But as I read it, I began to see, well, this is not what I thought Islam was. I'm learning things that I didn't know about this religion. And so after beginning with just reading it to satisfy somebody else, I began to read it and read more to satisfy myself because I became seriously interested in it. The, after giving me a few books and I attended a few lectures, I was given a copy of Yusuf Ali's translated Quran. And I began at the beginning, Al-Fatiha, Al-Baqarah, before I had finished Surat al-Baqarah, I said, this is it. I, this book, even the chapter that I've read, is not the product of a human mind, let alone the mind of somebody who had no education, was not even literate. Muhammad could not have composed this from his own head. It contains things that are far beyond what even a very well-educated person could know uh, uh, what a scholar could know, what a philosopher could know, this is far too deep for that. And turn where I would, I had to recognize this must be from Allah because it cannot be from a human source. And if that's what it is, then this is what I have been praying for and Allah has answered my prayer and I had better now change my religion and become a Muslim. So I think it was on the same year, 1961, uh, 26th of December, Boxing Day, <laughs> I went to the, what was then the Islamic Cultural Center, which is now the Central Mosque, and I did my kalima. So you can see the period was very short because I, I had no, once I had no doubt, I went uh, ahead with that. Um, after that, I got to know a lot of other Muslims of different nationalities, uh, Egyptians, Indians, uh, Turks, Sudanese. And what really struck me and impressed me was their kindness, their friendliness, their generosity. They're ready to welcome a stranger into their midst. Many times they would invite, invite me to come and take meals with them. And it was then I was learning Islam from them as the months and uh, years went by. They were never ashamed to talk about their religion. They were only too pleased. Just as in all your Muslim families, from childhood you hear, inshallah, ma'ashallah, alhamdulillah, uh, allahu akbar. Muslim children grow up with the name of Allah on their tongues. And now I was hearing it in the Muslim families and I found that a wonderful experience. Um, my parents, uh, when they learned about it, took the attitude of many uh, English people, well, it's your business, it's your choice. And they never tried to uh, persuade me to do otherwise. What they wouldn't like is the public appearance that look, you look odd. They are wearing a headscarf, you look odd. Uh, especially in those days when there were no, hardly any Muslim women around. And people used to ask, have you got something wrong with your scalp? <laughs> have you got a disease or something that you're wearing a scarf? Or things like refusing alcohol or refusing pork, it could be awkward. 
But apart from these practical things, they didn't have objection. I will answer that question because somebody is bound to ask it. Um, I'm happy to say that after that time, I married a Muslim, I have two children, I have three grandchildren, I've lived in Nigeria, my husband is a Nigerian, since 1966, and I've been working with schools, and that is what I spend most of my time on. Book writing is uh, something I do in spare time, and uh, the, uh, it was mentioned that I'm the current president of the Federation of Muslim Women's Associations in Nigeria. No, I'm not the current one, I was the first one. That was in 1985 when the organization was first set up. And I'm very happy to say that that happened at a time when I could say the time was ready and the Muslim women flocked to create this organization which has united Muslim women all over Nigeria, north and south, different ethnic groups, different uh, uh, financial status and so forth. And it's been uh, you know, a great experience for me, I'm sure. Allah had destined that that's where I would ultimately go, not to China, but to Africa, and to spend my life there. So I have never for one second regretted uh, the day that I pronounced my kalima and became a Muslim. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum.